we've been talking about being closer to God, and we're going to still talk about that, but what was highlighted to me about being closer to God and that would help us understand is the Lord is actually wanting us to learn how to be his friend, to be a friend of God in the spirit of Abraham. So James talks about how that the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So this, I, it's, we gotta look, kinda look at this really fresh because being the friend of God, what this is saying is God is so personal, so loving, so real, that you actually could be his friend. And what's really important here is not that we would just say that he's his friend, but that God would say that indeed we are his friend. To be able to be the friend of God is something that I believe we should be committed to. Not believing in God, but being his friend in the spirit of Abraham, in the spirit of Moses, in the spirit of David, in the spirit of Paul, that we would be, we'd be able to know this. Because this passage that James quotes, when it says, and he was called the friend of God, what is so powerful is the one who was doing the calling. And it quotes from Isaiah 41.8, but you Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of of Abraham, my friend. You see the, the power on this? That it's not just simply our saying, yeah, I'm the friend of God. No, I, I, don't, I don't want to say, if you want to hear this right, I don't want to say that I'm the friend of God. I want God to say, Jordan is my friend. Or, you, or your name, put your name there, that I call him my friend. Because, you know, I've been in relationships with people, and they say, you know, they've said, you know, well, he's, I'm a really good friend with Jordan, and I may not even know the person very well. But if I said, yes, I'm a good friend of that person, I know what I mean by that, and it means more, doesn't it? <laughs> it, it says something about the relationship, especially in this case, if God is the one who's saying it, and not just ourselves. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit wants to create in us a hunger to hear the Father say your name and say, he, she is my friend. And um, this is significant because it brings lots of things together. That's part of what it means to be identified with the Lord that we understand this friendship this way. So when you talk about friends, we won't get into it too much today, but I am going to be talking about what it means to be a friend of God for a while. Because this is so significant that the awesome, all-powerful, almighty God who is self-existing and always will be, that he himself offers us the opportunity and to have this relationship of friendship where I can know his thoughts and he, of course I know that he knows my thoughts and that we actually have an alignment of heart. This is a part of really being a good friend. If someone comes to me and, and says, you know, I want to be your friend and starts telling me about all the things they want and they desire and what's interesting to them, I'm saying you're not connecting with me as a friend. You're just wanting me to hear you maybe understand you, but where my heart is at, you're not even asking. You're not even maybe interested. You just want to tell me where your heart is. And you know, that's fine. But friendship is such, like Aristotle talks about, it's like, it's like one soul and two people. That there's this relationship that's so intimate and so deep that they understand one another and they are aligned for the same purpose. And so when God says that Abraham, that he is my friend, 
He's saying, Abraham is so into me. He knows what I'm about. So remember the thing I talked about last week. In this dialogue that Abraham had with God. He begins, you know, he was saying about how that, you know, Sodom, not be totally wiped out because what if there's some righteous people there? In fact, uh, let me quote uh, some of that again for context. <clears throat> he, makes a, he makes a reference. I'll just do it this way. He makes a reference, and he said, Surely you will not wipe out the righteous with the wicked. And he says, if there are, you know, if there are 50, you know, and then he bargains. It sounds like he bargains them down to 10. And <clears throat> the Lord says, well, even if there are 10 righteous, I will not wipe them out. But what we don't understand is, is that in, that, in those, that dialogue, Abraham is not talking to God as an equal or like he has to give him an answer for what's going on. He's saying, surely you will not wipe out the righteous with the wicked. And the reason that Abraham says that is because he knows the Lord. He knows that isn't you. So God is loving this dialogue. He's, it is actually a very a great opportunity to glorify the Lord. And it's wonderful because he's also bestowing honor upon Abraham. Abraham knows me. And remember he says in the context when he just gets this divine visitation right after the declaration that he's going to have a son, even <clears throat> in his old age, and, uh, and the, the presence of the Lord starts leaving him, and the Lord says to himself in the presence of Abraham, surely I'm not going to hide this from Abraham. See, that's a good friend. A good friend will make sure that his or her friend has such a connection that there's not going to be hiding important information from each other. Now, God would not just entrust this with anyone. He's going to entrust this with someone who's so aligned with him that he knows his heart. And so then we see this played out. But here's a significant thing that we don't see from the text because it's written in English, not Hebrew. And if it was written in Hebrew, we wouldn't know at all what he's talking about because we don't know Hebrew. But, but in the Hebrew, it's clear that Abraham is addressing God in two ways. One, he addresses the name uh, Yahweh. But then in this place, he says, um, <clears throat> in Genesis 18, 25 through 27, says, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. When he uses that name Lord there, that's a different name than Yahweh or Elohim. It is Adonai. This is important. This is about the new thing that God is going to do with us. This is about the surrender that was just talked about. Adonai. Adonai means basically this. The God who is sovereign. It is saying something about the relationship. Abraham is saying... You are 100% sovereign. And I am your possession. I know that. I know that I am your possession. And I also am mentioning you as Adonai, which we could say is master, because I know 100% I am submitted to you. I'm 100% yours, I belong to you, and I am saying Adonai because I'm coming from this place of 100% submission to you. Most people don't understand submission in looking at that dialogue, but that's because we don't understand who Adonai is. Not that he's just great and all-powerful, but that his love is so powerful and that he is so much given over to us that if we were to see him that way, as the God who loves so perfectly and is God, that we would want to call him Adonai. God, I am your possession. I don't want to have anything left over of me because your love is so great and because I know who you are. 
you are so wonderful to me. You have captured my heart, my soul, my whole life. You told me to leave my father. You told me all the fathers I've had, my whole inheritance. You told me to leave, and I left. And I left to be with you. This is why surrender is not a big deal. Surrender isn't just an act of the will, a relinquishment into the abyss of nothingness. This is a surrender is this embrace of God who is everything, who is the ultimate of all that is good and kind and generous. And God wants to give himself to the full to us. And the Lord wants us to understand that surrender to him is a blessed gift because he's everything. I have so much to say about this, but it's important to understand that calling God Adonai, Master, isn't just for one moment. It's saying, you know what? I'm, I'm done with choices around you, God. See, in our culture, this is really important because, you know, we have choices of churches, we think. We have choices of spirituality. We have choices of what we're going to pray, choices of how we're going to pray, choices about when we're going to pray, choices if we're going to pray. We have choices on so many levels, and our whole culture reflects it. Yes, you have a multitude of choices. And so now i got to think, well, what choice serves me the best? What is my preference in my service to God? Because I have lots of choices, and God gives me lots of choices. Isn't that right? The whole society is infected with, you have choices. You have opportunities. Make sure you make the most of your life and that you explore and exploit the most of the opportunities presented to you by God. Because God has just a whole warehouse of wonderful things that you could choose for. That is an, a, a way of thinking that dulls the power of the word Adonai. Because what Adonai would tell us, if we saw him as he is, if we were to relate to him as a friend and understand that he did the most kindest thing, the most loving thing any friend could ever do for us. He gave us his son, and his son echoes the same thing. But he says, you know, a friend lays down his life for his friends. And then he says, and you are my friends if you lay down your life for me. No, he says, if you obey what I command you. And what we don't understand is, laying down your life for him looks like total and complete obedience. It is not just obedience, doing the right thing. No, this is a love language. You talk about love language. God's love language is obedience from the depth of your heart because you have seen his love and wish to love him back. That's his love language. Not obedience, doing the right thing. Because without love, we don't know what the right thing is. Without seeing him for who he really is, we could be in total illusion and think, you know, I do pretty good. You're not going to use the term Adonai because you're doing pretty good. The person who says, Adonai says, I am totally possessed by God. I don't have choices. I'm so grateful I don't have choices. That God made the choice first. And that he said, I am going to be giving myself to you 100% because I love you. And since I am God, the best thing you can do, the only thing you can do to choose life is to completely and totally allow me to possess you and have a heart of hearts that you will submit 100%. That is this. You don't have to know how it's going to turn out before you submit. 
You don't have to know if it's going to be easy before you submit. You don't even have to understand what it is that I'm asking you to do before you submit. You see, this is Adonai we're talking about. In our culture, we gotta understand. It's gotta fit our personality. It's gotta be in our preference array. And we have to be able to think, I, gee, I don't know, is this my personality or not? This is just not understanding who God is or the kind of friendship that he offers. So really the first thing before I can wax eloquent, and eloquency is necessary here because it's so beautiful, before I can do that, we have to make it clear. You really don't have a choice. <laughs> Either you're a friend of God, or as James says, you're a friend of the world. There is no middle ground, pretty moral, pretty religious, pretty dutiful, you're okay. No, it's like friend of God, friend of the world. Because the reality is, we're but dust. Just like exactly what Abraham said. And it's important to understand, we did not create ourselves. It's important to understand, when it all ends, it's not going to end. That he himself is going to be there. So then we have to disabuse ourselves of a spirituality that thinks there are choices that are reserved just for that special person who I am. God's already said I'm special enough. He offers himself to the full. You see, the glory is that God would love this way. The glory isn't, I'm so special, God has to work with me. Or it has to feel comfortable to me, fit my personality type. Brothers and sisters, we then, God's just going to be an idea for us. He's going to be a bore and a burden if we don't understand, if we don't come to this intimacy with him that just says, God, you know what I, what I want? I just want to know you, that you are my friend, and I want you to be able to trust me so much that you can say, I'm your friend, that I'm totally aligned with you. This is just, you see, brothers and sisters, and I'll end with this. The church and the world needs people to give a testimony to God that abandonment is not something you work on. God himself has abandoned himself to us in giving his son. And so it's either we say yes or we say no. We don't say a little bit of me, a little bit more of you, maybe 80% of you. And we say, Adonai, you're my master. I'm so grateful that you possess me and that you love me so much that you would, you would like that. And brothers and sisters, what I want to say is there has to be a people who are able to reflect in their heart and in their temperament and in their thought life that they know God is real and that he is loving and that he is personal, and that he is beautiful and wonderful, so much so that you would never want to just try to negotiate our part because he's all in for us. So uh, I was just listening to a testimony of uh, a man who, he was Irish Catholic, and he was palling around with his Jewish guy, and they, you know, they just both partied a lot, drank a lot, and then, quote unquote, you know, they did some dope and all this kind of stuff, and they were just having a lot of fun. And, and uh, the Jewish guy discovers that his best friend uh, gave his life to the Lord, and it just really messed up that Jewish guy. He just thought, like, what are you doing? He couldn't understand it at all. You know, we were having so much fun. I mean, we were having the time of our lives, and now you're just becoming religious. And so he, uh, it, it was kind of a wedge in the relationship. But when, when he saw his friend again, he just said, look, just, just tell me, uh, why would you do this? <laughs> Given the good times that we've had, I mean, really, is this 
is this really improved your life? Is this like really such, such a big deal that you'd give up all that? And this is how he answered him. He just said, he said his face lit up with a smile and he said this, I know God. And he said that totally messed him up. That someone would know God. And from that point onward, the Lord began to deal with him so that he could know God. And that's what, that's the kind of relationship the Lord wants to have with us. And what invites that intimacy is absolute friendship, which leads to this kind of surrender and giving over where we know we're just, it's just all about him. My good friend, whom I'm, I'm so grateful that I could have this relationship with him and that he could give me his love in this way. There's just nothing, nothing else worthy of my life. There is no life otherwise.